For some of you that don't know, Alibet was debating a few time ago with Candice Owens about Catholicism. And as we know, Candice Owens has become Catholic. And now she's gonna, it's not really a debate, it's more like a conversation with Trent Horn. And I think it's really interesting that you weren't raised Catholic because most Catholics I know, you know, they would call themselves cradle Catholics. Whether they really believe in Catholic theology today, most people who identify as Catholics today, it's um, a longstanding tradition in their family. Maybe they're from Italy or they're from Ireland, and they've yeah. just always kind of grown up in Catholic culture. And growing up in Texas, that Catholic culture really wasn't very prominent or pervasive. I went to a uh, Christian school. I think I knew literally one Catholic. Yeah. And then I went to college, and I went to college in South Carolina, which is still in that Bible Belt. Not a ton of Catholics there. And yet that was like really my first encounter with a lot of Catholics. I had a roommate who was Catholic. I didn't even know that people actually put ash on their foreheads and on Ash Wednesday. The first time that I encountered that, I had no idea what was going on. And it's really interesting how Catholics and Protestants seem to kind of occupy in some ways different universes. Like yeah. I was talking to a Catholic who lives in the Northeast. She had no idea that we Protestants, when we say the church, that we're not talking about the Catholic church. Like right. we would say, I think you said earlier, you know, the church that Jesus established, I would say that too, right. but I'm talking about the universal body of believers. Whereas you're specifically talking about the Catholic church. She had no idea mm -hmm. that there was a difference when we say those sure. things, um, which, you know, it, it's just kind of fascinating. Catholics and Protestants have been together for a long time. And yet there are a lot of misunderstandings about the two. There are. I remember once uh, when I was doing. And that's why it's good for us Catholics and Protestants to have conversations. Sometimes we think certain things about the other Protestants or Catholics, whatever, which is not true. So it's good to have those kind of conversations like Ali is having. Pro-life work, the organization I worked for, we were half Catholic and half Protestant. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a great opportunity to dialogue with each other, but we were traveling in the, in the South, I think in Alabama, staying at a host family's home while we were doing pro-life outreach on university campus. And we spoke with them and it was funny. They said, they said to us, wow, I didn't think Catholics believed really in Jesus. You're the first really Catholics I've ever met and talked to. Hmm. And I've seen that. So well, of course, Catholics believe in Jesus. We got a big picture of him hanging on the cross because he died on the cross to redeem our sins right in, right in the front of church. We don't just only believe in Jesus, but we believe he's in the Eucharist, which we receive date. Well, I receive it daily. Other people receive it once a week. We, we receive Jesus in the Eucharist. So I think that you're right that, and that's why dialogue is always important to get past the misconceptions so that we can really understand the, the things we agree on. Yeah. And then the areas where we're still divided, where there's disagreement and where hopefully maybe we can bridge the gap on some of that. Yeah. And a, a lot of Catholics, because it's really something that has been more uh, passed down to them, it's part of the culture, maybe in the countries where their ancestors, grandparents came from. Um, they are very culturally Catholic without necessarily, I don't want to say not practicing it, but not knowing why they practice it. That I think is a lot of the experience that we Protestants have or evangelicals have with right. Catholics, that it's our friend in college who made sure to go to mass every weekend, but for the, you know, the rest of the week didn't care about it or didn't go to Bible studies or things like that. It wasn't a very personal relationship, it seemed. So I'm just saying that that's kind of the impression that I think a lot of us Southern evangelicals have, sure. which might sound weird to a Catholic who like you said, it's like, of course we believe in Jesus. What are you talking about? And that's why it's important because the same thing happens on the Catholic side. You'll have Catholics that will meet evangelicals, people who call themselves Christians, you know, someone who says they're Protestant, but they have no problem posting really immodest pictures on their Instagram. And they totally. go around saying that they're, well, I'm Christian. I believe in Jesus. Like, well, okay, but what about yeah. where are your other actions conforming? And that's why when we uh, analyze, try to understand another faith, another church, uh, what we should always do is take a look at what does that group officially teach? Right. And also, what is who are the best representatives of it? Yes. And always make the comparisons. If you're going to compare, it should always be worst to worst, best to best, yeah. not worst to best. I, I totally <laughs> I totally agree with yeah. that. Oh, powerful. When you're going to compare, always compare best to best, worst to worst. Oh, no, that's powerful. I'm sorry, my Protestant brothers, but our best are saints. People who fasted, for days without eating, people who only pray, people who went to the desert, people like Mother Teresa who help a lot of people, people who die, we're willing to die for God, for the Eucharist. We have a lot of great saints and that's something I'm grateful of my Catholic Church. I cannot just get inspired by my Lord, but He sent us people to get inspired and try to imitate their footsteps 
because they live a holy life thanks to God. God did incredible things in their life. There's just a lot of genuine curiosity I have about um, Catholic theology. First one is about Mary. I would say this is one of the biggest points of confusion. My holy mother Mary. Mary. And no, this is not adoration. It's just a statue. I don't think it's God. I don't think Mary's here. Just like I kiss this, I kiss any other image of my mom and my daughter. Well, not daughter, I'm sorry. My nieces. For us as Protestants okay. is Catholics praying to or through Mary. And it's important to me to try to use language that Catholics would agree with. I don't want to misrepresent. Yeah. And so if I do that, it's not on it's not on purpose. And I've had a lot of Catholic friends tell me, well, we don't worship Mary. Mm -hmm. um, and while I want to be careful not to say that Catholics worship Mary, because you all say that you don't, yeah. I would say it looks a lot like worship. I would say mm -hmm. that it looks to me like praying the rosary, praying to Mary, which is something I completely disagree with. Yeah. Um, it looks a lot like worship. And I don't see this veneration of Mary, this level of honoring Mary, supported by scripture, the mm. gospels, the epistles, revelation, Jesus himself at all. Mm -hmm. So we the rosary is supported by the Bible. Like everything about the rosary is in the Bible. Where does Mary and doctrine come from? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that the doctrine related to Mary comes from the word of God. And when you look in scripture, the phrase word of God primarily, if not entirely, actually refers to the spoken word of God, what God speaks, what the apostles speak. So 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for example, says that uh, Paul went and the word, they recognized the word of God had been spoken to them, not the words of men. So I would say that what we understand, just, and this is where when you start with Mary, of course, we have to be careful not to look at it through, uh, like, what is the framework we're using to determine doctrine? Because if we start with an assumption related to sola scriptura, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about, well, I would say, well, if we're going to analyze something, we have to make sure the framework we're using is, is a fair one. So we would say that it comes from the word of God, both spoken and written. And when you see, you see in scripture, uh, Mary herself says, uh, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. We recognize just even from logic that Mary is the mother of God. She is the mother of of the creator. She didn't give Jesus his divine nature, but she is the mother of the God man. So that makes her very close uh, in relation. It's as simple as this. If Jesus chose Mary, if God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus, like she had to be wholly pure. The reasons for, but also, I mean, I do have some of, some of my own questions. Cause I think sometimes if a Protestant looks at this, it, like I said, if you don't have the great, if you don't have it depends on the framework, how you look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you say, well, where is this in the Bible? I would say, well, where does the Bible say everything a, a Christian believes or does has to be found in scripture? Um, yeah. So for, so for example, like let's take the sinner's prayer, for example. Uh, so you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. Uh, I believe you died on the cross for me. Uh, forgive my sins. And uh, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. You know, the sinner's prayer. Uh, there's nothing like that in scripture. Like, would you agree? I mean, there's, there's yeah. no one, there's no, and there I, is no, I don't believe that the sinner's prayer is some magical incantation that brings mm -hmm. Jesus into your heart. Now, to be fair, I was raised <laughs> believing that or thinking that. Um, but I think it's more about acceptance and belief in confession, which we do see mm -hmm. reflected in scripture. Um, but not that that particular incantation is found in scripture and that it mm -hmm. must be said in order to validate or uh, mm -hmm. guarantee your salvation. I'm not sure that any mm -hmm. Protestant believes that. But would you agree that it's, it's appropriate, it's okay to say that prayer as long as you're not superstitious about it? Um, yes, I would say it's mm -hmm. okay to say that prayer. Even though it's not in scripture, it's not explicitly, but mm -hmm. we would certainly say that we find the idea of acceptance and belief and mm -hmm. confession in Scripture in the same way that we would say the word Trinity is not in Scripture, but we can see from John mm -hmm. 1, for example, or even in the very beginning, that God is three persons, but one God. And so I would say that Protestants accept that, that not mm -hmm. everything <clears throat> is verbatim in Scripture that we say mm -hmm. or believe. We have our own creeds. We have sure. our own Westminster catechisms that we believe are an accurate summary mm -hmm. of Scripture, but that Scripture must be our standard. Of course, we believe in interpretation. I believe in preachers and teachers. I like mm -hmm. to use different uh, acronyms and alliterations to remember biblical ideas. Um, but of course, I believe that it's our, um, that Scripture is our inerrant inerrant and inspired standard. And that's what I would say about the so-called sinner's prayer is that it's not inerrant. It's not infallible. Mm -hmm. I would be open to even saying it's wrong. It should be changed. But by what standard am I comparing that prayer? Mm -hmm. Scripture. So that would be my mm -hmm. issue with like, that would be my issue with praying to Mary is that, no, I don't think that every prayer that we pray has to be explicitly found in mm -hmm. scripture, but I don't even see the idea of praying to Mary in scripture. Mm -hmm. That's my issue. Okay. So I'm trying to understand your standard when mm -hmm. it comes to, because you're saying we should use the Bible as our as our standard to determine doctrine and practice. Mm -hmm. um, 
And what's funny is as a Catholic, I could actually agree with that in some sense, because I could say, I agree with you that as, as a Christian, nothing we do should ever contradict what is taught in scripture. Yeah. And that's what I don't like about the praying to Mary. But then where, where is that? There's a difference between it not being in scripture yes, and totally. it being contradicted. For example, yeah. no one in scripture prays directly to the Holy Spirit and says, come Holy Spirit and kindle in your, in the hearts of your faithful, the love of God, you know, Holy Spirit guide me today. That's not in scripture. But he's God. So, and so we could at least make the deduction. So I would actually even be satisfied with some kind of like deduction. deduction. Sure. But when I when I look at, for example, which I think we talked about maybe in the debatable. So let me let me well, uh, maybe I can explain my view and you can respond sure. to it and you yeah, can yeah. kind of break it apart. Maybe That's that fine. would be the easier way to go. So when I'm looking at scripture and I see, for example, when Jesus is given the opportunity to treat his mother in a special way. So I'm looking mm-hmm. at Mark three, for example, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking out, uh, looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. We don't ever see any kind of special honor, special veneration of Mary by Jesus. We don't see it in any of the epistles. You would think that she would come up in Revelation. We do see it. The first public miracle of Jesus. It was in the wedding. Remember? And we could see her intercession there. Mary went with Jesus. And she said to him, they don't have no more wine. And what did Jesus answer? Women, what do you want with me? My time has yet not come. And what did Mary do? She didn't even respond to Jesus. She knew that whatever she said, Jesus was going to do because he loves his mother so much. So she looked at the servants and said, do whatever he tells you to do. Like when we're looking at the Last Supper and the and the or in the marriage supper between the bride and the bridegroom, you would think that if mm-hmm. Mary was this important, if we needed to pray to her, if she was watching over us, if she was protecting us, if she was really this person carrying our prayers to Jesus, mm-hmm. like we would be reading about her a lot more in Scripture, and we just don't. And mm-hmm. even when Jesus is given the opportunity to pay special attention to his mom, he he basically brushes her off and says, "I don't even think that she's more special than any of these other Christians out here or any of these other followers of me out here." Well, I don't think that's what Christ is saying here, because it reminds me also of the episode where the woman says to Jesus, uh, blessed are the, are the breasts that nourished you. And he said, rather, blessed are those that hear the word of God and obey. Yeah, that's a great other example of that. But, but I think what's, we can misread that because Jesus, of, like one could take that so far as to say, oh, you know, your mother doesn't really matter. You don't have to worry about your mother. What matters more are other believers. But the Bible is also very clear. You have special obligations to your parents. Like Jesus railed against the religious authorities for the Corban rule, for donating money to the temple when they were supposed to care for their aging parents. Paul says the person who doesn't care for their relatives is worse than an unbeliever. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So I I would worry that to take one narrative episode and try to draw more out of it than than is being taught. That's just one example for me. Sure. But both of those examples, I'd say what's going on here is Jesus is saying that to have a special relationship with him, it is not necessary to be his biological kin. Uh, anyone can have a special relationship with him through faith in him. Whereas at the time, you would think, oh, to really have a special relationship with the Messiah, if you're the brother of the Messiah, yeah. you, you know, I could never be that close. Just no, we all can be close to Jesus. But that's kind of what Catholics are saying about but, Mary, that she's mm-hmm. so special to him because you, we don't just pray to anyone in heaven the way mm-hmm. that Catholics pray to Mary. And sure. so you guys are saying that, yeah, all Christians can have a relationship with him, but Mary has the special, special, special relationship with him. Well, I, I, what I would take from there is, what I'm saying is that in order to have that relationship with Jesus, you don't have to be biologically related to him, but some people have more of a relationship with Jesus, are closer to him than others. I, would, I think that's very clear from scripture. So for example, in James 5, 16, it says that the prayers of a righteous person are very powerful. Or if you look in the book of Job, for example, at the end of Job, when God deals with Job's friends, he tells them, have Job pray for you. I will hear his prayers because you've, you've spoken ill of me, spoken poorly of me. Uh, that when you see in scripture uh, and that those who are holier, they're closer to God. Their prayers are more efficacious. So Hebrews 12, so who are the holiest people? Hebrews 12 says that those who are in heaven, the spirits of, they're the spirits of just men made perfect. So those who are in heaven who are perfectly united to God, and we see this in the book of Revelation, talking about the angels carrying the prayers of the saints to the throne, that they have that special relationship with God, a special efficacy. I, I think to understand praying to Mary, praying to the saints, uh, that's language that I find to actually be not very helpful. In fact, when you read the teachings, the official teachings of the Catholic Church, you don't have phrases like pray to the saints. 
Rather, the phrases are seeking the intercession of the saints. So for example, like, let me ask you, what would you say prayer is? Prayer is pleading with God. Prayer is, I mean, it can be praising God. It can be making requests to God. And of course, we have access to the Father through Christ. And mm -hmm. that is, you know, a Protestant retort or a retort that I would have is mm -hmm. that we have one mediator and his name is Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit as our intercessor who, when we don't have the mm -hmm. words to speak, Scripture says, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And I also, I love Ephesians 3.12, that through Christ Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence sure. through our faith in Christ. So when I read, for example, James 5, that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working, well, I think of that verse that I have boldness and access and confidence through what? My good works? No, my faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And Christ, he who uh, knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. So that means it is my prayer that has great power as it is working. It is every Christian's prayer that has great power as it is working. It is not that the quote unquote holier person has greater power. It is that those who have been made holy by Christ in his perfect righteousness, mm -hmm. that our prayer has great power. Um, and so, again, I just don't see a need to use an intercessor of Mary one, because I don't think that she can hear our prayers. And I don't think mm -hmm. that's in scripture at all. If you have the opportunity to make that prayer more powerful through the intercession of someone, w wouldn't you do it? Of course. I mean, everybody has their family members to pray for them whenever you have something going on, an adversity. The same way, we pray to the saints, we pray to Mary. Yes, of course, God is going to hear us, but we, we want to make that prayer even more powerful, asking through their intercession, because they're holy, they're pure. Everybody who's in heaven is holy. But also, um, yeah, I, I just don't see that biblical support that because she's holier or because she's relationally closer, that she has some kind of special access to Jesus and therefore we should mm -hmm. pray through her. Do you ever ask other people to pray for you? Yes, but not because I think that they have some kind of special power, but because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so I want, you know, I, I want people praying and I want... But but why when you can just pray to God yourself? Why, why involve other people when you're righteous enough just to pray yeah. and ask God for it? Because I think there is encouragement in that. And I don't know that it necessarily, we don't read in scripture that it sways God to have a certain number, a certain critical mass of people praying for something. But because we are all called to pray, it's an act of obedience. And through an incredible preordained order that I don't think we fully understand with the sovereignty of God, that he's also in control of all things. And yet he asks us to evangelize and pray. I don't totally understand that mysterious conundrum. And yet he commands us to. So I think it's an act of obedience. I think it's encouragement. Um, and God you're not, hears you're our sure, prayers. You're not sure if our prayers actually affect what he does? No, I do. I think oh. that it's mysterious, though, for us to say that God is omnipotent, that yeah. he's not suspended by linear time, yeah. that we can't, that no plan of his can be thwarted, Job 42, 2, mm -hmm. and yet our prayers actually do something. I'm just saying that all of that is true, and yeah. I'm not sure it's within our finite ability to perfectly be able to explain that. That's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. I think the, <clears throat> the difficulty that comes when Catholics and Protestants discuss this is going to come down, I think, to language. I asked you, when I asked you what prayer is, the definition you gave is interesting that prayer is making a request of God. One of that's one of the mm -hmm. things that prayer can do. If what's funny is if that is what prayer is, then asking Mary to pray for us, that actually wouldn't count as prayer because I'm not directing that request to God, I'm requesting it to another creature. So what's the when you pray the rosary, what is that? When you pray the rosary? Yes. Well, I would say what prayer is, prayer is just a request. So okay. in the mo we've restricted okay. the word prayer in a modern sense to mean exclusively yeah. making a request of God. But traditionally, the word the word prayer comes from the Latin word precare. Like pray tell. Pray, yes, yes. if you've listened to all kinds of pride and prejudice, yeah. I, I pray thee tell, pray this. Right. Uh, so prayer to the saints, that, that would just fall under I ask. I ask, I ask this. So, so you can pray. asking Mary to carry your request to Jesus. Mm -hmm. just yeah. so, so the idea here is that we have agreement that it's good for members of the body of Christ here at least on earth, who are in communion with one another, to pray for one another, that that's a good thing. And it's good to seek out intercession among other members of the body of Christ. What Catholics believe is that the body of Christ does not exist solely on earth, that there is only one body of Christ. There's only one body, not two bodies, not three. There is one body, and that is made up of believers who are on earth, as well as those believers who are in heaven or being prepared to enter heaven. Uh, they're all connected through Jesus, who is the vine, we are the branches. Uh, he is the resurrection and the life. Even though you die, you will live in me. So we believe the saints in heaven 
while their bodies lie in the earth, they are more alive in Christ now than we are even yeah. right now. Uh, that The book of Revelation says the souls in heaven are aware of the sufferings on earth and cry out for God to do something about them, what's happening to the martyrs. So our belief is just that if you can ask for intercession from members of the body of Christ in this life, and we're still connected to the body in heaven, through the, the power and love of God, we can ask those in heaven to pray for us, that there's nothing wrong. So for example, if, if you have a boy at his mother's tombstone who's died, and he says, you know, mom, pray for me, I think you'd agree there's nothing, I, I think most Protestants, there's nothing wrong with that. Wrong with? Like ask, you know, asking, for example, a, a boy asks his deceased mother and father in heaven to pray for him. Oh, no, we would say that there's nothing wrong with that. Why? Oh, we would not. We don't pray to the dead. And I know that they are spiritually alive, but we don't pray to the physically dead. We, we, we don't. I, I don't understand that. If they're holy, they're in heaven with God. Why wouldn't you ask them to pray for you? believe in that we just don't because we believe that jesus is our mediator and yeah well, you're, you're saying we can't ask you're saying we can ask christians on earth to pray for us we can't ask christians in heaven to do that yeah that would be the protestant belief that we don't believe that the dead are hearing our prayers and have the ability to mm -hmm. carry our prayers to god or that they oh, are wow. inter that would be intercession, intercession right, right? that they are mm -hmm. interceding for yeah. us and we don't believe that the dead or that um, we would call all Christians saints. So the saints in heaven are interceding for us or that Mary is interceding for us. Um, yeah, I don't think that we necessarily see that reflected in scripture. And yeah, so the Protestant would say that there is a problem with that. We would say, oh, we don't pray for the dead. We could think about them and consider them, but we wouldn't pray to them, no. When you've got Mary and mm -hmm. you have all of these millions of people asking her for intercession, mm -hmm. is Mary in the Catholic view omniscient? Like how does she, how does she order all of these prayers? If she is a human who is of course now in heaven you're it almost would it would necessitate ascribing to her godlike characteristics mm -hmm. of omnipotence and omniscience if she can hear the prayers of millions of catholics at once mm -hmm. well i would say that mary's ability to hear multiple requests in different languages that doesn't fall under omniscience because omniscience means that you have all knowledge it's not omniscience the knowledge of the saints in heaven even if it is vast by human standards it's still infinitesimally small compared to the infinite knowledge of God. You see, but she, so, but you believe that there is some kind of, um, not just spiritual transformation, but that there is a, an incredible expansion of people's capacity mm -hmm. to know and to do when we get to heaven. That includes mm -hmm. the ability to discern, sorry, to discern millions of prayers at once in mm -hmm. all different languages, somehow prioritize, order, carry those requests to God, and that Mary has achieved that kind of transformation and expansion of her capacity and yeah. all of the saints as well. I, 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 where does would, that idea come from? Well, I would say there is nothing to restrict an omnipotent God from, from allowing his creatures to have more cognitive abilities. Oh. Sure, yeah. Oh. Nothing can restrict God from doing anything. Oh. So I'm not... That was powerful. I mean, God could do anything. If he wants to give his, his children gifts, he's going to do it. Sure, if that's necessarily... if that answers my question. Well, I, you're asking how, 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 could, she, how, how she does that. She couldn't do it on her own. And I would say God allows her to do that, that just as God can give humans on earth supernatural knowledge of the future, for example, like to be a prophet, or God can give people knowledge of things they wouldn't naturally have. Mm -hmm. uh, God can give the saints in heaven knowledge and abilities they would not naturally have on earth or have in accord with just their own abilities. So, so where I, do I just Catholics like, get, yeah. that, get that idea? that he has granted Mary the ability to answer all these prayers and to kind of specially give them to Jesus. Well, I would say that there is a long tradition of this. Like if you go to the catacombs, for example, that the very first Christians, the oldest known liturgical prayer, most scholars dated to the third century, like the oldest Christian prayer outside of scripture is called the Subtuum Presidium. Most scholars are dated to the third or fourth century. Uh, and that prayer says, it's a prayer to Mary. It's a request to Mary, O Theotokos, God bearer, mother of God, uh, place us under the wings of thy refuge. Uh, it's, it's asking Mary, who's the mother of God, to intercede on behalf of sinners. Or if you go to the catacombs, where Christians were hiding, where they were buried, there's little inscriptions in there that say things like, Peter and Paul, pray for Primus, a sinner. You know, little, little things like that. Friends, if you just said, use the Bible in the sola scriptura sense of, we have to find it at least deduced, implicit, you know, we have to find it here in scripture. You're, you're worried about too much coming in and the Bible will uh, help cut out some of the extra stuff that's, that's an accretion or ancillary. Uh, I, that's what I see as one of the big pro the Protestant concerns where Sola Scriptura has a benefit. But, well, I wouldn't, now, there can be a benefit in cutting out extra things that are just human traditions, that are not divine traditions. Uh, that's why I would say you shouldn't believe anything that contradicts Scripture. But my other concern from the Catholic perspective is that if we use Sola Scriptura, 
uh, if we just use that based on individual interpretations of scripture, we risk failing to believe certain things, that certain things could get left out, for example. Uh, so we risk being able to distinguish, like, you might say, well, it's fine if you're a Calvinist and this guy's an Arminian. Mm -hmm. like, There's more to the podcast and I'm going to leave the link in the description below. I want to thank Ali and Trent because what an incredible conversation they had. And like I said at the beginning, I feel like we Protestants, well, we Catholics and Protestants, we have to have more conversation, more dialogue, and just see our different points of view. Because like I said, too often in times, we think certain things about the other that are actually not true. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up. See my other videos here. And then, yeah, thank you so much. God bless you all. I love you. Ciao.